Well, good morning. You hear that? It's a microphone. Yeah. Uh, yeah, new mic guy, new mic. From now on, it's always going to work. That's what I've been told. I've been, you know, secured, promised. If not, you know, we will have new mic guys, what we've been told. So, <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 5 is where we're going to be today. If you have your Bibles, turn with me there. We're continuing on in our journey through 1 Corinthians. And, uh, you know, our, our plan is to get through this book by the end of July. And, uh, and so we're kind of moving along. And, uh, you know, the, the great thing about preaching through... A book of the Bible is you learn context and I think context is essential to understanding the scriptures understanding how they apply to our lives and so I pray that uh, you know that you'll take this seriously uh, and that you come prepared to hear a message from the Lord that you come prepared to hear from the Word of God each and every week first uh, Corinthians chapter 5 we're gonna go through the entire chapter again this week 1 to 13 and uh, it's a, a short chapter, so uh, I, I think we'll be uh, getting out of here in time for lunch. So let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for the day. We thank you so much for the many blessings you've given to us and for this opportunity that we have to gather together in this place. And Father, I do uh, thank you for the many blessings you've given to us. I thank you for our time together. I thank you for the, the many different elements of worship that we've experienced here this morning for the the songs have been sung, the prayers have been lifted up, the gifts have been given, and the testimony that we hear, Father. And I just, uh, I'm so thankful for the people that are in this room. I'm thankful that you are an unseen guest here today. And now as we come together and we look at your word, Father, I pray that you would help us to understand it in a way that will bring about truth and sincerity to our life, that will bring about restoration, that will bring about salvation of souls. Father, I recognize uh, I have a part in this today. And so Lord, if you would forgive me of my sin and cleanse me of the unrighteousness that is in my life and give me the grace that is needed to preach your way, to preach your word in a way that bring honor and glory to your name. And Lord, I just recognize my, my need for you this morning. I really do. And Father, if you would uh, speak through me and Father, I pray that if someone here today that has never accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that today would be the day where they hear the Word of God, they hear a message from you, that their life, that their heart would be pierced and their lives would be convicted, and they would turn away from their sin and believe. Father, I pray for the believer that's here today. Father, I pray that you give them a, a spirit of surrender to us. And that, Father, you would allow for them to know your will for their life. Father, we sing of these old hymns, and I pray that, Lord, that the words of our mouth would be true. That we wouldn't just be doing lip service, but Father, that we would truly surrender all. Father, help us today when we are weak. Give us the grace that we need, Lord, to do the things that you want us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, and all of God's people said. Sometimes, what is known about you is what you are known for. Like it or not, sometimes what is known about you is what you're known for. When I was in high school, there was a, a guy in our football team. He was a, a lineman, a, a defensive lineman, and he was just a, a, a big, ugly defensive lineman, you know. He was really good, too. And actually, his senior year, he won MVP for our team. You know, not to me defensive lineman win most valuable player but he he was that guy he was just a phenomenal athlete and if you just saw him play and if you 
you know, didn't get to know him very well, you would think that's what he was. But he actually was an incredibly bright young man, and he still is to this day. Uh, he, was, he graduated the top of his class, and so he was more than just a dumb football player like myself. He was actually well-educated, very intelligent, and a very kind young man. Sometimes, though, what is known about you is what you're known for, like it or not. Sometimes, what is, what is known about you is what you're known for. In our passage of scripture for today, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, sexual immorality has defiled the church in Corinth. And Paul, the apostle Paul, is afraid that they are going to be known for their immorality rather than their love for the Lord. Verse 1. It's actually reported that there is sexual morality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans for a man has his father's wife. The word actually that Paul uses to start this chapter can be translated holy, not as in holy as in H-O-L-Y but as in whole, all. What Paul is saying that it is widely known about you that there is someone in your congregation that's having an immoral relationship with his stepmother. The sexual immorality that is being discussed, of course, is incest. We don't know the exact course of this relationship, but what we do know that this was not his mother, but the text says it was his father's wife, so this was his stepmother that he was having a relationship with. Paul says that This is not only immoral with the church. It's not only immoral with God, but it was even immoral with the pagans, the heathens. So what essentially Paul is saying is, even what you're doing now isn't even acceptable among the non-believers. You're doing something so immoral, so wrong, so sinful, that even people who do not believe in the name of Jesus wouldn't even accept this as common practice. And that's saying something for the church in Corinth, <laughs> for the people of Corinth. They were as liberal and as sexual immoral of a group of people as there was at this time, friends. I read this week from Dr. Utley that in the Old Testament there's a distinguished distinction between the terms idolatry or idolatry, idolatry and fornication. Idolatry is when one or both are married and fornication is when neither is married. And in the Old Testament, again, there's a distinction between the two. But it's not the case in the New Testament. Sexual morality refers to any sexual sin. That is idolatry, fornication, homosexuality, even bestiality. Friends, there is a, a lie that has creeped into the church that has said you can't tell other people that you are sinning or you can't tell others that they are sinning, rather. Paul explains this quite well at the end of the chapter, but let me just say this. If you are here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, then my, my first priority is to share Jesus with you. Okay, my, my, my chief objective would be to share the love of Jesus with you and your need for Jesus. And through that, I will also talk about your sin and why you need Jesus. Because you're a sinner. And Jesus is your savior, your source of redemption. But I won't criticize you for your sin. Why? Because you're a sinner. You're just doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're acting like you're supposed to be acting. But if you're here today and you are a Christian, then we are to hold each other accountable. If you are living in sin, then brother, we're going to talk. And if I'm living in sin, then 
you should talk to me. You better speak up. Paul is saying. And Paul in this passage of scripture is speaking up. Some of you might say, well, pastor, you've been telling me for the last two months that he wasn't an apostle. And he had the authority to speak into people's lives that you and I don't have the authority to speak about. That's true. Somewhat. But look what he says. And look what he tells the church in verse 2. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. In a matter that you should be mourning over, he says, you're proud of it. Can you imagine the church being proud of sexual immorality? Never going to happen, right? Never in the history of church has there been a congregation that's proud of immorality. Never before have we seen immorality praised and celebrated in the church. You ever proud of something that you should be ashamed of? I remember in the eighth grade, I had a science class, Mr. Slavin was his name, Roger. And he made us do all these different projects. And I, uh, I remember one time we had to build a bridge. And another time we had to build a bottle rocket. I was pretty proud of my bridge until he put the bucket on there and started filling it up with sand. And then I realized that I should really be, I didn't know anything about physics. You know what I mean? I should be ashamed of that bridge. It was nothing to be proud of at all. Some of us are proud of sexual sin. We have no idea what the Bible says, no idea what it does to a person's relationship with God, no idea that the destruction that it brings to their life, to their relationship with others. We'll talk more about this in the next chapter, but Paul says of them, remove this man from your camp. Paul is calling for the church to discipline. He's calling for the leadership of the church to discipline the one who is living in sin. He's not calling for them to, to celebrate or to prize those who do whatever makes them happy. He says, discipline him so that he may be reconciled. The goal is reconciliation, restoration. Don't believe me? Don't believe this is Paul's goal? Look at verse 3. For though I were absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When are you assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus? And my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Paul is asking them to acknowledge what he is saying is truth. And to act as if he was there. Paul is calling them for, he was telling them to excommunicate this man. And for whatever reason, he doesn't talk anything about the woman. So maybe she's not a believer, I don't know. We don't know the details of that. But he is very much talking about this man and the need for discipline. So obviously this young man, this son, was a member of the church because he's saying, hey, you need to excommunicate him from the church. (laughs) He was a believer. Paul is saying to remove him from the congregation. He is not saying that by doing so that he would stop being a believer. Paul doesn't have that kind of power, nor does the church. But Paul is saying that his presence in the church is not only going to harm the church, but it's also going to harm himself. So kick him out and allow for the powers of this world to handle him. Paul is fully aware That this may lead to this man's death. It may lead to the destruction of his life. Friends, there is power in the church. There's power. And being a part of a local body of believers. It brings protection. It brings community. 
It brings people into your lives that will bear your burdens. That will encourage you. That will love you. And that will walk alongside of you even when you do wrong. That will love you. That will be sincere. That will speak truth into your life. And when necessary, they will discipline you. You ever been disciplined by the church? Ever had a, a brother or a sister come to you and say, hey, what are you doing here? Why are you doing this? Ever have somebody love and care for you enough to have the intestinal fortitude to speak truth into your life? Even when you know it's hard? Even when you know you're doing wrong, it's... You think it's easy for that person? Has God ever called you to share truth into somebody else's life? It's not easy, is it? It's not easy going to someone and saying, hey, this, this thing that you're doing, it leads to destruction. I know the, the, the way to destruction is why everybody's doing it, but listen, the, the gate to our Father, it's narrow. The goal is restoration for this man. If not on the earth, then uh, at the minimum of eternity. He wants the same for the church. Friends, sometimes you lose an apple in hope of saving the whole batch. And friends, sometimes, friends, sometimes you just got to, you know, you got to slice off a piece of rotten apple. And the, you can still eat the rest of it. I mean, the apple's still good. But sometimes you just got to get rid of the bad. In order to save the apple, in order to save the entire batch. Look at verse 6. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the whole the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Paul again condemns the pride and arrogancy of the church leaders. You see a theme here friends? This arrogancy was a huge problem and at the root of the issue, friends. The leadership, full of pride, full of arrogancy, and got in the way of their responsibility to do what is right. Paul says to them, get rid of the pride, then you can get rid of the sin. If you don't get rid of the pride, then you cannot get rid of the sin. Their unwillingness to discipline them was the cause of this man's destruction. They were unwilling to deal with the sin and the sin spread throughout the church. This love and illustration is synonymous today with this bad apple analogy. Uh, a bad batch of leaven would just ruin, wouldn't just ruin one loaf, but it would ruin all future loaves as well. They would take a, when they would make a, a a batch of leavened bread, an unleavened bread, they would take the, a, a piece, of, a lump from that and they would set it aside and they would put it in the water and then they would use that for the next loaf. And so if it was bad, then the, not only was the, the current loaf bad, but the, the next loaf was bad. And so the best thing to do was just get rid of it. If it was bad, just get rid of it. Just throw it away. You're wasting your time. Just do it now, Paul is saying. Get rid of it now. Do what's hard now. I know it's going to cause you more work later. I know it's going to, it's going to be difficult. It's, it seems like it's going to be easier for you just to keep it and maybe hope that it's going to... You ever have conflict in your life and you think it's just going to go away? You ever think, if I just let it be, if I don't deal with it, if I don't have that conversation now, maybe I just put it in the corner, set it aside, and maybe it'll just go away. Does it ever go away? No. What's it do? It festers and it gets worse and it gets worse. And you should have just dealt with it years ago. But you're too scared, too unwilling. Maybe I'll hurt their feelings. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll make it worse. Paul's saying, get rid of the sin now before more damage is done. I realize this is a harsh message, 
But it can be done in Christian love, friends. Look at what he says in verse 8. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Paul's not irrational. He's not hateful or mean-spirited, but he's a man of truth and sincerity. He's a man of wisdom. Paul's life has been changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he knows, hey, once you become a believer, that old life has to be gone. You have to get rid of it. The new must stay. It must penetrate every facet of our life. Friends, is our life not much greater today than it was prior to conversion? Has your life not changed? Has your relationship with God not been restored? I can't imagine my life without Jesus, friends. Uh, I've shared this with you before, but I promise if you met me prior to getting my life right with Jesus, you would not like me. I would not be your friend. You would not enjoy my company. What Paul is saying here doesn't mean that you shouldn't hang out with unbelievers. It just means that you should like their character. And you shouldn't allow for people who, who know better to influence your life. Listen to what he says in verse 9. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexual immoral of this world or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters since then you need to go out of the world but now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of the brother if he is guilty of sexual morality or greed or is an idolater or reviler or drunkard or swindler not even to eat with such a one for what have I to do with judging outsiders? It is not the hours inside the church whom are judged. God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. In verse 9, Paul is referring to the, the previous letter that he wrote in, to 1 Corinthians. It's often referred to as the lost letter. Many of Paul's writings were lost. We don't have them today. Uh, for our good, what we have, though, God has saved and allowed for us to be fruitful for our lives. He says here, don't associate with the people who are sexually immoral. But he clarifies that he's not talking about those who are of the world. Paul isn't telling the church in Corinth not to, talk, not to associate with the unsaved. I mean, look at Jesus' life and who he associated with, right? I mean, if we... If we had that kind of life that we're not supposed to associate with unbelievers, Paul's saying, hey, you won't even be able to live in this world. I mean, they're surrounding us. I mean, how are we to be the light and salt of the world if we're not to associate with those who are living in darkness? How are we to share the gospel with them? So Paul's not saying, hey, don't associate with these people. He's saying, hey, the people inside of you, inside of your congregation, the men and women who are members of your church who are living in sin, who are unrepentant, who are unwilling to turn away from their sexual morality, their idolatry, who are mean-spirited, who are corrupt financially, who are drunkards. He says, those people, they shouldn't be associated with you. 
You need to deal with this. Because if you don't, it's going to ruin your testimony in this community. You have to, he says. You have to. You have to be willing to address the elephant in the room. That if you claim Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, then your life should resemble this. Confession of faith. That, you're, that Jesus is now the Lord of your life. He's the Savior of your sin. And if, if he's a, the Lord, that means he's going to direct you and lead you to paths of righteousness. And you are to follow him down that path. And you are to repent and turn away from the evil that is in this world. The sin that is in this world. Your life should be different than those around you. Paul started this letter out by stating that the sin of this man caught in immorality was widely known and that it was negatively affecting the church's reputation. Now, I think there's a fine line between church-wide discipline and one believer going to another believer and confidence and saying, hey, I, I know what's going on here. I've been there before. What are you doing? Matthew 18, Jesus gives us the way in which to have such conversations privately. I firmly believe that if you feel led by God to have such conversations as discussed in Matthew 18, then you better be prayed up. You better make sure there's not a, a plank in your eye while you're pointing out the speck in your brother's eye. You better do it out of sincerity, out of love, and out of truth. Uh, my wife recently told me that it is the 25-year anniversary of the movie, The Titanic. I haven't seen the movie in full since it was in the theaters. I've, I've seen bits and pieces of it since then, but I've been blessed and fortunate enough not to have to sit through with it <laughs> since then. The Titanic's a, a tragic story, is it not? Uh, oftentimes it's, it's such a well-known story, such a big story and big topic, it's just kind of hard to talk about without people kind of glazing over. Kind of like the Abraham Lincoln story and his assassin. I mean, it's just almost almost too big. I do like the story though and I think I find uh, it interesting the story of the captain of the Titanic Edward Smith. Edward Smith had been a, a boat captain for uh, almost 30 years. Uh, he had been in on the sea for over 40 years you know and um, he at the time of the Titanic, he was one of the most well decorated, one of the most experienced sea captains in the world. While he decorated, he actually, prior to uh, being the captain of the Titanic, he was the, the captain of the, the largest ship previously in the world. So he had all the experience. I mean, his brother was a, a sea captain. I mean, he just, it was in his blood. Had a great track record and of course he had some incidents here and there, but he had, I mean there was nobody more experienced, more qualified for this role than Mr. Smith, Captain Smith. And yet, when the Titanic hit the iceberg, he was told at like 11.20 that, of the evening that they had two hours and the, sick was, the, the ship was going to sink. He had two hours. Nothing you could do about it. And if you look at the criticism of this captain, he didn't do what he was supposed to do. I mean, he just, he was, oftentimes he was told that he was paralyzed by fear, by the moment. And instead of talking to his crew and, and getting members of the crew to get 
people on life boats he just didn't communicate anything at all he shrunk it's kind of a sad story is it not a man who faithfully served for 40 plus years and uh, one moment defined his life you know he just had a bad two hours you know sometimes in our life friends we we uh we make mistakes we uh we do things that we shouldn't do we say things we shouldn't say we go places we shouldn't go we look at things we shouldn't look at we talk to people we shouldn't talk to we go to dinner with somebody that we're not supposed to go to dinner with sometimes we make a bad business deal sometimes we allow the anger to get the best of us sometimes we drink too much or sometimes we eat too much or sometimes we like money too much and if we're not careful these mistakes that we make become a habit become our identity become who we are and one mistake becomes two mistakes and two mistakes become three and three becomes you know friends I, I I've got a, a history of bad mistake a, a life of, of bad mistakes that I've made and I mean, if you looked at a, a reel of my life, you would think, man, why is this guy up here? You know? Why am I listening to this man? Oftentimes, Satan can get the best of me and just say, why is, you, you don't deserve, you shouldn't be up, there. you shouldn't, if God, God, there's no way God can use you. And that was then though friends and this is now and friends let me tell you something you you can allow for your mistakes to define you by continuing to live in them or you can make a decision to repent and to turn away and Satan let me tell you friends will give you every excuse to not every excuse in the world to make you think that you're not good enough, not qualified enough, not loved enough by God. But let me tell you something, friends. That is a lie straight from the pit of hell. It is. God loves you and desires for your life holiness, righteousness, faithfulness, and obedience. He desires to have a relationship with you. He desires for you to be restored into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Repent, friends, and turn away. You know the sin that is in your life. You know what it is. And if it's there, friends, let me tell you, you're not alone. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells us this. We're going to talk about it here in a few months. The sins that have overtaken you are not uncommon unto man. That means the things that you're dealing with and the things that you're dealing with and the things that you're dealing with and the things that you're dealing with, guess what? Somebody else is dealing with the same exact thing. But God is faithful. And he will give you a way out of that sin. You just have to be willing to say, yes, Lord. And this is that time in our service where you can say, yes, Lord. I will follow you. Father, we give you thanks for this day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together in this place. And Father, I pray right now, right here, that you would speak to us in such a mighty way that you would penetrate our heart, you would sanctify our thinking, you would correct our desires, you would take the sin that is in our life and cast it in the deepest part of the sea, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would give us a desire to follow you. 
Father, if there's someone here today that has never accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation, the day where they admit that they are a sinner, believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and confess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And for the believer that's here that may be struggling with sin or maybe you're just having a rough day, Father, I pray that right here, right now, that you would give them the grace they need to just know that you love them, that you care for them, that you have saved them from their sin. And nothing on this earth can take that away from them. Nothing. So, Father, give them the peace and the assurance that they long for. The hope that is found in your Son, Jesus Christ, and Him alone. And all of God's people said, Amen. Friends, we're going to sing a song of invitation. We're going to invite you to stand and sing with us. And as the Lord leads, I want to invite you to respond. I don't know how God is speaking to you today, but I pray that however he is speaking to you, in whatever way he is talking to you, that you would respond. This altar is here for you. If you want to come forward and, and come and kneel or come and pray, you can. If you want to stay in your seat, you're more than welcome to do that. I'm going to be back in the Welcome Center. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to talk with you. If there's anything I can do for you today, please do not hesitate. Stand with us and sing.